Okay, to welcome to the seminar today. And today we have Alexandra Bella, Bella again. He's going to give the second seminar here on our channel. And this time it will be on his ex exciting work on localizing information in quantum gravity in the one over an expansion. So over to Alex, over to you. Great, uh, thanks a lot. Well, thanks for the, the invitation. Uh, I remember the talk last time being a lot of fun. So hopefully this time, uh, it'll be the same. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the talk today is going to be based on a, a paper that came out roughly a month ago, as well as some work in progress. Um, and it's with uh, it's a collaboration with Ayurab Bahiru and Nilo Farvardian, who are both at CISA and are graduating PhD students. So they're on the postdoc market this year. Um, and, and Kiriakos Papadonimas and Gabor Soroli, who are both at CERN. Um, and before I get started, um, I think we're all pretty tired of Zoom talks by now, at, at least I am, um, but I, I think many people share this. So uh, I decided that I'll be writing in real time, um, so to mimic as best as possible a Blackboard talk, which means I'll cover less, but I think it doesn't matter. Uh, the goal is to make it interactive and try to reduce the Zoom fatigue as much as possible. Um, great, so don't, don't hesitate, stop me, ask many questions, uh, and let's try to keep this informal. Um, so, so the question I, I want to address today is the following, uh, can we or, or how can we localize information in quantum gravity? Can we do it at all? And uh, if we can, how do we do it? So before, before discussing quantum gravity, let me perhaps start by discussing uh, simpler things and, and remind you how we can localize quantum information. Okay, so how do we localize quantum information? Uh, let's start with quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, we can localize quantum information. Um, and ultimately, you should see this as coming from the fact that, um, you know, operators at space-like separation commute. Okay, if, if two operators are space-like separated, their commutator is zero. Um, there's, a, there's a more uh, sort of direct way to see it is through the construction of split states. So in quantum field theory, if you consider, uh, here's the spatial degrees of freedom, let's consider a time slice, um, and let's divide it into three regions, a, B, and C. Um, it's a property of quantum field theory that you can construct states called split states that are completely unentangled between A and C. Okay, so these states, they have the property that they're completely unentangled. Um, between A and C, okay? Now, it's important that you leave a little buffer region B because if you didn't do that, uh, because there's a lot of UV entanglement in quantum field theory, um, you know, in, in very nearby local degrees of freedom, uh, it would not be possible to do this while retaining finite energy. But provided you leave a little buffer region between the two regions A and C, you can completely unentangle them, okay? Which means that it's impossible to tell what the state is like in C from correlations in A. Okay, so if you compute any correlation function you want in A, uh, in a split state, uh, you know, you cannot know what's happening in C. You cannot know that C is if, if it's in the vacuum or not. So these quantities give you no, no access to any information in C. Okay, and in particular, you have no way of knowing whether or not you acted with local operators in the region C. Okay, so because these states exist, you can localize quantum information. You can, you know, there's a lot of ways to construct many different states by acting with all these operators and see that are completely, that the region A is completely blind to. Okay, so th this, is, this is how you localize quantum information. Uh, and, and I should say this works even if you have a gauge theory. Okay? okay, if you have a gauge theory, you have to be a little bit careful because if you just act with, say, a positive charge, I don't know, plus Q here, that's not going to be good enough because there's an electric field that gets mediated out to infinity. In particular, you can read it up from A, okay? So this by itself does not work, but you can still localize information because you can also act with a negative charge uh, minus Q here, 
and put a Wilson line that connects the two. And now this is a localized uh, object that lives strictly in C and that it's impossible to tell whether or not you acted with this thing um, if you have a split state in a gauge theory. Okay, so you have to be a bit more careful because you can't just act with any local, local operator because if it's charged, you'll be able to read it off from infinity. Uh, but you can construct objects of, of, of this type here, uh, which work just as well. Okay, so even in the gauge theory, you can localize quantum information. So that was the case of quantum field theory. Um, now let's talk about classical gravity. And again, please interrupt me if, if there's any questions. So in classical just gravity- to, yes. Just a just just small thing. Uh, in, yes. in gauge theories as well, I mean, it, the statement is exactly the same, right? In that, because you can put negative charge in the buffer, uh, you can't, you know, if I if I only have access to observables in A, I have zero information about C. I don't even know its total charge. Uh, oh, because, because, of, because of the buffer, you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, thanks. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. That's right. Um, um, good. So in, in classical gravity, um, the way we describe the degrees of freedom, say again, you fix some, some time slice or some Cauchy slice, let's call it sigma. Uh, and then, you know, if you think about a canonical treatment of, of gravity, you, you talk about the phase space variables, which are the induced metric and the extrinsic curvature. Maybe it's not just gravity, maybe you also have scalar fields around. So you would talk about, you know, the value of the field on the time slice uh, and its time derivative, which is the, the momentum. Um, and these are phase space variables. You can excite them in any way you want. So you can, you can build you know, a lump of matter or a lump uh, of metric perturbation in some region of space time. Now it's a theory of gravity. So there's constraints. Um, so in particular, uh, what you cannot hide is the total energy or the total mass uh, of this configuration. So the total mass you can read off. Um, you can read off from infinity. Um, but that's it. The details of the lump, you will not be able to read off. Okay, so there's many configurations that have the same mass at infinity uh, and that are strictly localized, and you will not be able to tell which one uh, it is if you're living strictly at infinity. Okay, so in classical gravity, it's also um, completely possible to, uh, to uh, uh, localize information. Good. And plus, I should have put a, a green check for QFT. It can be done. Now in quantum gravity, uh, it depends a little bit what you mean by quantum gravity. Um, if we're talking about non-perturbative quantum gravity, the answer is most likely no. The essence of holography is that there are no local degrees of freedom uh, and that everything li lives at the boundary. Okay, that's, that's you know, the essence of what holography is, and that's certainly the way it works in ADS-CFT. Um, and so non-perturbatively, if you allow yourself to have access to something that's fully non-perturbative, um, there is going to be no way uh, to, to you know, localize information deep inside a bulk region because all the information is accessed near the boundary. okay? Um, I, I don't think we have a theorem, but I mean, I think if you believe in holography, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that the answer to this question is no. Okay. Sorry, why don't we have a theorem, Alex? I, I think we can prove this pretty clearly in flat space and I mean in, in ADS, right? So what is the objection to uh, these uh, results in, that in, we have? Yeah, I think if you if you believe in ADS, yeah, in ADS CFT, it's I think it's clear. It's in flat space, it's a little bit more subtle to me because I don't think we under I don't we I don't think we have a non-perturbative definition of quantum gravity in flat space. Uh, but the results that we had with Siddharth and so on say this is true, provided, I mean, some weak assumptions are met in that you have a projector in the vacuum, you can, uh, you know, the, the, the vacuum can be identified by a boundary term and you're in a certain super selection sector of the Hilbert space. Uh, so subject to those assumptions, you can prove non-perturbatively that all the information is available in a, you know, near the past boundary of future null infinity. Yeah, yeah, but what I'm saying is that, you know, when you talk about the, the algebra of operators and so on and so forth in flat space, it's not completely clear to me that we understand what that means non-perturbatively. 
Whereas in ADS-CFT, I think it's very clear that we understand what it means. It's just the, C the algebra of all CFT operators. And that's a well-defined thing that we have access to in flat space. Asymptotically, it's well-defined, right? Because asymptotically, the algebra is what it is. I mean, so it's the algebra of asymptotic operators. It's simpler than ADS because, you know, the OP is simplifies at infinity. So asymptotically, you know, you might have like all sorts of fields, uh, but asymptotically, the language of QFT is 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 good in, in flat space. I mean, we can discuss more later, but yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe we can discuss uh, more a little bit later, um, but, but yeah, okay. To me, I would say the following way is I don't know of a, of a non-perturbative definitions of a, quant of a quantum gravity S matrix in flat space, fully non-perturbative, which we do have in the CFT because we have a non-perturbative definition of n equals to four supernatural mills, and that makes it slightly cleaner. But I, I agree with you that the philosophy is exactly the same, um, and so we, we don't expect this to work. Um, the sort of interesting regime, which is the one that I'll be discussing in this talk, is quantum gravity in gene union, so, so, you know, I don't know. Non-perturbative quantum gravity, we don't think it works, uh, but, but what about quantum gravity in gene union perturbation theory? Okay, that, that's, that's the question. And this is sort of a gray region between classical gravity where we know it does work, and quantum gravity where it does not work, non-perturbative quantum gravity, this is perturbative quantum gravity. And so the question is, you know, on which side does it lie? Does it, is it, does it look more like classical gravity or does it more like look like quantum gravity? Okay. Um, now, one reason to, to see that this question is not completely uh, trivial is, is the following. So, so say you have some, some, some gravitational region uh, and, and you try to, you know, create a local operator somewhere in, in, in space time. Okay. Um, classically, you can do that. Um, but, but quantum mechanically, uh, this is not a dip invariant operator. Okay. Um, because how do you specify the location of the point? You cannot do that, um, in, even in perturbation theory. Uh, and so what you need to do to make a well, just, just like for, for, for the gauge fields that we had before, uh, the way to make dip invariant operators is by connecting charges with Wilson lines. You need to do the same thing for, for local operators uh, in, in perturbative quantum gravity. Um, and in particular, you need to uh, gravitationally dress, which is the uh, same. Alex, uh, your, the, the presentation, uh, we don't see the screen. I see the screen. How about now? Uh, no. We simply lost it all of a sudden. The screen. Uh, now it's back. It, it was back. It was back. Okay. Sorry, I don't know. Do you see now? Yeah, it's back. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, I have no idea what happened. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So, what was I saying? So, you can create this local operator, but it's not diff invariant. Okay. Uh, and to make it diff invariant, you need to gravitationally dress it, add a gravitational Wilson line. Uh, and this Wilson line needs to end somewhere. And typically, the, the nice thing that we, we like to do is if there's a boundary, uh, we'll, we'll add the gravitational Wilson line uh, all the way to the boundary. Okay. Uh, and then you can, and then the operator is, is, is diff invariant. Um, but of course, the problem is that if you do that, um, then uh, this operator can now be detected from the boundary. Okay. And, and the way to see that is that. Uh, you know, in GR, the, the Hamiltonian is a boundary term uh, and this boundary term, so H, I don't know, let me call it boundary, it'll become the CFT Hamiltonian in a second in ADS CFT. Uh, the commutator between uh, this, this, ham this boundary Hamiltonian and, and the, the local operator that you um, created is no longer zero, okay? In particular, it's order G. Okay. Um, 
And so, um, so, so this sort of tells you, and this, and, and this is really, you know, this is the gravity, this is the gravitational Gaussian model. Well. And unlike gauge standard gauge theories that have both positive and negative charge, there's no negative charge in gravity, and so there's no way to, to screen this information, and it has to reach the boundary. Okay. Um, so, so, so even in perturbation theory, there's this issue that you need to deal with, and it's not clear that you can deal. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, you know, you can make pretty solid arguments. For example, like Suvrat and his collaborators have a, have a paper around the vacuum of ADS, uh, where you can just, you know, see that um, you 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 have to, you know, implement this gravitational Gauss law, and that means that you can you you cannot localize information that you can always detect it from the ground. Okay, um, so so this is the issue, and 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 the goal for today is the following. Um, what I want to show is I want to present evidence um, that in fact you can localize information. In perturbative quantum gravity. Um, okay, but this will only work for a class of states. And spoiler alert, the vacuum is not within this class of states. And what I'll do is I'll explicitly construct What I'll do is I'll explicitly construct, um, uh, you know, lo local operators, different variant local operators, or approximately local operators. Okay, that's the goal for today. Uh, so, so, Alex, just one uh, question about about motivation. So, uh, of course, uh, I, I know you you'll discuss a nice CFT construction, but uh, just within semi-classical gravity, this construction was already known. I mean, from the time of Divet, right? Which is to use uh, some background field as a as a clock, or use something else as a clock. Yes, that's right. I mean, I'll I'll get to describe it in a second. And this was already known. And I think the well, okay, to, to my knowledge, the people that use this the earliest are cosmologists because they they are people thinking about quantum cosmology because um, there there's no boundary at all. So you could have net you could have never done the thing that I had on the previous slide where you dress it to the boundary. Uh, and so the natural thing to do is dress it with respect to the clock. Yeah, probably um, Divit even earlier, like 70s or something. Like in the 70s, I see. Classical okay. paper, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, the I mean, I'll, I'll mention this in a second, but starting from the bulk is a little bit dangerous because you can write something down that, you know, maybe you think makes sense in genuine perturbation theory, but you don't know if it can be completed to be a non-perturbative quantity. Um, that, that may or may not work, and it's going to be very hard for when you build something directly in the CFT, you're, you know, first of all, you know that it's well defined and it's manifestly diff invariant because it's built in the CFT. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So then that, that's the that's the method. But I'll, I'll I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so so this is the goal, uh, and I, and I just want to make um, so some comments. Can I can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, if uh, you say this works for a class of states, is are these states? Um, uh, can these states be gotten by acting operators on the vacuum, or are, are you saying it's a it's a sector uh, that's yeah. that's sort of yes, uh, formally uh, they can be they can be obtained by acting with operators on the vacuum, but you have to act with many operators or very heavy operators. So uh, there, you know, in a CFT, any state can be uh, gotten by acting with sufficiently many operators and at various places um, on the vacuum. Uh, mm -hmm. But but they're not close to the ADS vacuum. They're very far away. They're very different from the vacuum. And I'll tell you exactly what you need to know about the states. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That that's an important question. Um, okay. So 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 some comments is that um, this is relevant for the black hole information paradox. Uh, 
I would say particularly in flat space because um, in, in ADS, what people have done is, you know, taken an, an ADS CFT setup and coupling the boundary CFT to non-gravitating bath. Uh, and there you can just define entanglement entropies in, in, the, in, the, in the bath itself. And make, they make sense because it's, it's quantum field theory. Uh, but in flat space, it's much less clear how you split up the Hilbert space. Um, and, you know, what you would like to do is sort of do a split of the Hilbert space of this type where you separate, you know, what's going on at infinity from what's going on deep inside the space time. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, in, in, in a theory where gravity is not turned off, what do you mean by this split? Okay, and probably this split non-perturbatively does not make sense. Um, but of course, if you can show that perturbatively there is a way to split and localize information that, I mean, if you can show that there's a way to perturbatively localize information, there's presumably also a way to perturbatively split the Hilbert space and make, maybe you can make sense of a quantity like the entanglement entropy of whatever is outside the dashed line. Okay, I will not do that in this talk today, but uh, I think it's an interesting application to try to study these ideas. Okay, if you show that you cannot localize information in perturbation theory, you know this thing right? Um, yes, to Alex, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, so when you, uh, so in this context, uh, where it is, uh, uh, so here we know that uh, this non-perturbative effects uh, actually play a, a big role in, in the derivation of the islands and uh, like if you do it through. Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I think that's yet a, a next layer is then saying, um, yeah. you know, uh, once you define a quantity that you think makes sense, whether or not non-perturbative effects change the answer to it. Uh, but even in, even before asking the contribution of islands, you have to start by defining the quantity. And if you cannot, you know, localize information even in perturbation theory, you will not even be able to define the quantity that you're trying to calculate in the first place. It will just not make sense. You have to define it strictly at the boundary, and then, you know, following Subra's argument, you have all the information. So. So, yeah. uh, right, right. And I appreciate that. But uh, but the other related point also is that normally a perturbation expansion has is divergent, and you need a non-perturbative uh, things just to, uh, to just to uh, they should exist. So it is some sense I think they uh, some non-perturbative effect should also be captured if you to some extent can be captured. Uh, otherwise, it. Uh, uh, I mean, okay, you can define it through this one over an expansion, but the expansion may be not well defined. You mean because it's an asymptotic series and not a convergent series? Asymptotic and... series. That's what effective yeah. field theory should always be like. Yes, so, yes, yes. Yes. So, so that's that's certainly true. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a follow up on that, Alex? So, uh, yeah. so far I agreed with everything you said, but this this uh, this I I am a little uncomfortable with because it seems that the entanglement entropy is is a non-perturbative quantity, right? Because pure states and thermal states differ by e to the minus s by two corrections, but the entanglement entropy is completely different. So the entanglement entropy is a very fine-grained quantity. So if you want to see something like the define, you know, as, as you know, uh, if you want to define an entanglement entropy of the thing outside the dashed line, then to have a perturbative you know, construction of local operators would not be enough, right? You would need explicitly some non-perturbative splitting. Uh, yes, that's that, that's true. Um, but I think there's a different way to think about, um, well, I was gonna comment that this was gonna be my second comment. There's a different way to think about entropies, which is from, you know, from von Neumann algebras or from, from, al from operator algebras. And depending on the nature of the algebra, you may or may not be able to assign an entropy to it. But in certain cases, certainly you can assign an entropy to an operator algebra. And what I'm saying is that, um, you know, if you can define an operator algebra in some very small region here or in its complements, you may be able to assign an entropy to it. Um, okay, but you would have to, ex well, we can discuss this later. I mean, since I guess this is not going to be the main part of your This is not the point of my talk. I, I wanted to say, and this is, a, okay, this is not something that we have done and something that we're thinking about, but, but yeah. But what I'm, okay. I, I think the general philosophy is that if you can localize information, there might be a way to associate um, to associate entropies in new ways. Now, maybe they will not make sense non-perturbatively. They'll, they'll fail non-perturbatively, but they could sort of make sense in perturbation theory. And you know, maybe this is a way where you sort of get the Hawking answer in perturbation theory, even though 
the object you're computing doesn't really make sense non perturbatively But okay, this, yes, like you say, like, yeah, this goes beyond what I wanted to say in the talk. It's just a comment that I think one should keep in mind as, as a motivation for this. Uh, and the thing, yes, sorry. Yes, great. No, it's please ask uh, all the questions. Uh, no, no, I, I have a, <laughs> a very naive question. I think uh, because okay, I ahead. did not. Uh, follow up uh, some of the future works. Uh, so I remember that uh, at the level of linearized gravity and also in the, uh, I think, subleading order, like the next order in G Newton corrections, there were some papers uh, discussing some HKL type construction of uh, like operators such as wild tensor, which will be commuting at the level of two and three point functions. Um, so what was wrong with that? I mean, that was already for the vacuum ADS, I think, uh, around the vacuum state. So I think you said that's not possible. So is no, it yeah. like uh, in the next order, it breaks down or something? No, no. So I think what people have done is studied corrections to HKLL. So HKLL needs to be corrected in one of Ren per perturbation theory. Uh, you can correct HKLL in an interacting bulk theory in order to make an operator in the center commute with, you know, say all single and multi-trace operators built out of it at the boundary. Yeah, so um, I think I don't the, know what extent when you correct it properly at the subleading order of G Newton, at least at the level of three point function, I think it was shown that the wild tensor, which is a local operator at the free field theory level still remains a local operator at that next order. Um, I think this was this paper by Gilad and Dan. Uh, well, I think what I'm claiming is there's no way in HKLL to do that such that you commute with the boundary Hamiltonian. Because when you solve for HKLL in the first place, you have to sort of fix the gauge. You know, I don't know, pepper yeah. grand gauge or whatever. And, and that's really sort of the essence of the problem. And what that'll mean is that if you work through it, you'll, you'll, you'll always not commute with the boundary Hamiltonian. You, you can try to fix HKL as much as you like to commute with everything else, but the Hamiltonian, you'll, you'll run into a problem. Yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah, I think they considered another local operator at space like separation and saw the. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It has, okay. it has pretty explicit how they it, Sorry? They, yes, I just want to say in these papers, it's pretty explicit. They, they don't, they try to satisfy the Gauss law. So they, they don't have a non zero, I mean, they do have a non zero commutator with the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. You you just can't do it as Alex. You, you just can't. Yeah. 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 Okay. But but you can you know you know if if you forget about gravity for a second you could have an interacting quantum field theory in ADS, uh, and then you know you will need to correct the HKL prescription to relate it to boundary data and you can do this order by order in perturbation theory and you know it's just a QFP in ADS so things will have to commute but one needs to bring through the details and that works. But, yeah, yeah, but no, no, I, I agree. I, I missed the, um, uh, I guess the crucial comment that you are constructing something that will commute with the boundary. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so the, the second comment, which we already alluded to, is that there's a connection between what I'll be saying today and a series of, of, of papers that have appeared recently by, by Liu and Leutrisser and by Witten, um, you know, Pennington, Longo, Chandrasekharan. Uh, and, and, very, and various collaborators. Um, they study it more from an algebraic QFT perspective and discussing al von Neumann algebras and different types of von Neumann algebras that arise in this context. Um, and if you're scared of von Neumann algebras, hopefully you will find this maybe a bit more illuminating because I think it's gonna be more, more constructive, okay? But, but there is definitely a connection uh, with that work. Okay, um, so how am I doing with time? Yeah, I'm running behind, but like I said, it's perfectly fine. Um, uh, we'll just see how much I can cover. So, 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 the, so the plan for the rest of the talk is pretty simple. This was an introduction. Um, what I want to do is just construct finite local operators. So I'll do it explicitly, and I'll tell you the properties that they satisfy, and in which states we can do this. Uh, and then I'll end with some interpretation uh, and comments. Okay. Good. Um, so, like we said earlier, uh, following Surat's question, 
there's two different ways you could try to, to approach the problem. So here's the problem that we want to solve. And you could try to approach it directly from the bulk. And then you can try to define op local operators and perturbation theory, or even potentially trying to capture non perturbative effects or whatever you want to do. Um, but the problem is that if you try to attack the problem from the bulk, you're not clear that what you're constructing makes sense at the non perturbative level, right? Not just that it remains local at the non perturbative level, but simply that it makes sense, okay? So it's not clear that whatever you try to do, uh, that, that things will be well defined non perturbatively. And you know, checking that is extremely difficult. Okay, so in particular, even if you have some candidate operator, maybe it doesn't solve the constraints non perturbatively. How will you ever know that? It's going to be extremely difficult to, to find out. Okay, uh, an alternative, which is what I'll be doing today, is to construct it directly in the CFT. Okay, the advantage is, is that now different variance is built in. Okay, any CFT you object to create is manifestly different variant from the bulk domain. Okay, and it makes sense non perturbatively. So I think this is uh, more promising. Uh, of course, the advantage of the left hand side is that if you know how to do it there, uh, you presumably know how to do it also in flat space and in the sitter space because you know you only use use bulk physics. Whereas on the right hand side, what I'll be doing today, well, you know how to do it if you have a, a CFT construction, which we do in ADS CFT, um, but you will maybe not know so straightforwardly how to apply it to flat space or the sitter space. Okay, um, but hopefully at least the the, the message uh, that that this works will will prevail, and then it'll probably teach us something also about uh, other space signs. Other asymptotics. Okay, so um, let me say something about the class of states. Okay, so the class of states we want to consider uh, are states dual to semi classical geometries. Um, and in particular, it'll be very important that uh, geometries. That the states have the following two properties: uh, that the expectation value uh, of the Hamiltonian is of order n squared. Okay, so in other words, one over g nu. I'm using n equals to four terminology, but hopefully you understand what I mean. That the expectation value of the of the energy is order n squared, um, and that the variance, the energy variance, is also large, also of order n squared. Okay, in particular, this means that energy eigenstates are not in this class. Okay, and, and actually the vacuum fills both properties. Okay. Um, and the way you should think about this second condition physically, uh, so the first condition is just that the energy is, is large and means there's a large amount of back reaction on the space time. Okay, it's a strongly back reacting space time. Uh, and the second condition is that it's Physically, the way to think about it is that this the space time is macroscopically, scopically, uh, time dependent. Okay, you can show that if you have a space time that's macroscopically time dependent, the variance of the energy has to be uh, at least of this order. Okay, so these are the properties uh, of the states that I mean, these are the types of states. Uh, uh, that that I'll consider, and th there's various examples um, of such states. For example, there are states created by a Euclidean path integral where you turn on sources for single trace operators. Uh, these you think of as coherent states of the quantum gravity theory, um, and, and these states satisfy the properties that that we have here. Uh, you can also uh, consider, you know, boundary states in CFTs uh, that you evolve for some amount of Euclidean time. Uh, these also work. Um, the way we think about these states is that typically they're dual to, to you know, pure states with end of the world brains behind the, the, the horizon uh, or, or many other types of states. Okay, these are maybe the, the, the two most famous plus. Okay. And what's really important about these types of states is that um, the overlap 
between two different semi-classical geometries is exponentially suppressed in n squared. Okay. In particular, since the space-time is time dependent, uh, you know, if you evolve one state by some amount of time and you look at the overlap with the state itself, this is also expon exponentially suppressed. Okay, and that'll be you know the, the most important feature that I'll be using this talk today. Okay. Uh, and so there's, there's a there's a there's a question. Just one question is, yeah. uh, suppose you do a quench in the boundary, this will also be in the same class, right? Uh, a quench a in the boundary? Quench, uh, you change some coupling at the boundary as a function of time. And, and then turn it off. You, or you just evolve it as a function of time. So, so, so or make it switch well, it off. Yeah. So if, you, if, you, if the deformation stays on, then the problem is that you're deforming the theory. So you know you're no longer in the theory you started with because you've modified the Hamiltonian. Um, if you turn it off, then yes, you're back in the original theory, and all your quench has done is pump some energy into the system. And it and depending on how you do the quench, but if you do a quench with like you know single trace operators, um, yes, you expect the state to be semi-classical. Uh, in fact, boundary states often people talk about them in the context of quenches. And the way you should think about these Euclidean path integral states is that they're a little bit like Euclidean quenches. Prepare an excited state of the Euclidean path integral by you know, deforming the theory, but you turn it off as you approach the t equals zero time slice, such that you get an excited state of the original theory. Um, but yes, the very similar things happen in the context of quenches. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so you can define the return amplitude, which is just the square of the thing that I wrote, psi of t, psi of zero, modulo squared. Okay, and in this class of states, the return amplitude uh, is expected to have the following form, n squared f of t for some you know, positive function of t. And it'll behave this way up to, to, to very, very uh, long times. Uh, at early times, uh, you know, at early t, you can show, and now this is pretty rigorous in the large n theory, that it, it behaves as minus n squared t squared. Okay, and then as time goes on, the t squared becomes this function f of t, but it's an order one positive function. So, you know, after an order one time scale, this return amplitude, which is the square of the overlap, is very, very, it's exponentially small. Okay, there's various, so, so if, if psi, is the TFD state, the thermal field double state, uh, you know, R of T is just what people call the spectral form factor, which I guess, you know, Subrat and Kiriakos told us about many years ago. Um, and we know the spectral form factor has this decay, but in fact, this decay will happen for any one of these semi-classical states. Okay, and we, we don't have a formal proof of this, but I, I think it's pretty natural. If you believe these things are are coherent states, then the overlap of the two coherent states is you know, an exponential and n plays the role of one over h bar here, roughly speaking. So, so you expect a, a formula of this type and any gravitational computation that you would do would also produce a result. Okay. Uh, and, and finally, the last property is that if you, you know, if you sandwich an order one number of single trace operators between these overlaps, you won't change the fact that the answer is exponentially small because you know a finite number of single trace operators cannot connect two different semi-classical geometries. That's how you should think about this. Okay. And the number again. Okay. Um, so so these are are the properties uh, that 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 I'll that I'll use for the state and sort of everything will follow at the math level, everything will follow from what's in this what's on this slide. Okay. Good. Um, so now the, the way to phrase locality, a nice phrase locality, which was also discussed by Kirakos and Surat in a, in a previous paper, is to consider the algebra that I'm going to call A, which is the time band algebra of single trace operators. Okay, so remember we have some states that's discussed, that's describing, you know, uh, 
uh, a Lorentzian spacetime where you know maybe matter is contracting, then maybe there's a supernova and matter expands back out. Okay, and what we want to study is pick a time band, a sort of narrow time band of the CFT. And consider the algebra of all single trace operators that 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 live in that time band, okay? Uh, and ask, are there operators uh, such that they commute with this algebra? Okay, do 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 such operators exist? Interpretation: If you do find them, is that they correspond to bulk operators? So here you can draw sort of the causal the causal wedge of this time band. Uh, which you know doesn't go very deep into the bulk, and if you can find these operators, the interpretation is that they're operators that are in, that are in the sort of complements of this of the causal development of the CFT time. Okay, that would be the interpretation. And remember, it's not clear that these operators exist at all because you would think that any operator that you create inside here will be detectable from the boundary through the Gauss property. Okay, um, but what I'll show is that for these class of states, we can't find such operators. Okay, uh, and again, I think just to, to remind you that the different levels of the thing, as n goes to infinity, we just have QFT on a fixed background. And then uh, it's manifestly true that these operators exist. Okay. If we really talk about finite n and non-perturbative things, so you replace the algebra of single trace operators by the algebra of all operators, then we know that the answer is no, because that's the entire set of CFT operators, okay? You don't even need a time band, pick literally a time slice. And if you have access to all operators of the CFT, it's clear that there's nothing that can be with them. You just have the entire uh, algebra, you have the entire operator set, the full theory, okay? Um, but we're, what we're gonna be interested in is large N, but one over N perturbation. Okay, and here, here's where the, the question mark that it's not obvious because of everything that I said before with the gap. Okay, uh, and, and, and just to make sure that everybody remembers this, but there's a way to construct operators, which we already talked about, which is HKLL. So you pick some, some point at the center that's labeled by say TR and the, and the spherical coordinates. Uh, and the way you construct this operator using the HKLL construction is that uh, you smear the boundary single trace operator that's dual to the field phi with some kernel. Uh, and the kernel is such that it solves the wave equation uh, for the scalar field on this particular background. Okay. Um, this is how you construct the HKLL operator, but remember that if you go to subleading orders in one over n perturbation theory, uh, the HKLL operator does not commute with the CFT Hamilton. Okay. It's, or, it's order one over n or one over n squared. Okay, so the idea will be to try to find a way to improve on this HKLL construction uh, such that uh, such that uh, you know we, we do have an operator that you cannot detect from the boundary. So what I'll do is I'm going to define an operator. Let me call it phi hat that satisfies the two property. That the commutator with the, the Hamiltonian of phi hat is zero to all orders in one over n. Okay. And the second is that phi hat, oh, I don't need this bracket here, phi hat uh, acts just like phi h KL to leading order at large n. Okay. Now, if you find such an operator, it commutes with the Hamiltonian, uh, and that's kind of what we're what we're after. Okay. But at the same time, you don't want to just create some junk that acts completely differently. You want to make sure that it still has the interpretation of creating a local local bulk operator to leading order at large n. Okay. Uh, which will be the thing. So, so what is the operator? Here's the operator. So this is a definition for phi hat. C is just some normalization constant that you shouldn't worry about. Uh, so it's an integral
So I'll define all the quantities uh, very soon. Okay, so it, it, it's an integral where you do some time evolution, you evolve with e to the ith. Uh, you insert some projectors. So these are projectors onto the code subspace. Of phi zero, of psi zero. Okay, so it means that you project onto psi zero and to all states that you can uh, obtain by acting on psi zero with a finite number of single trace objects. Okay, uh, and T star, T star is just an order one time scale. It's just some time, so you integrate over some time at least at least of order one in the large n. Okay. Uh, and now the claim is that this operator satisfies both of the properties. Okay, so let me prove that and you'll see it's pretty quick. So let's start with property one, commutation with the Hamiltonian. Um, so uh, you can write down the following expression. So this, this is just a way to rewrite the commutator. Uh, and now you insert that in the previous expression here. Okay. Uh, so what will happen is that, um, so this thing will begin, so you still have the minus I, you have this normalization constant that we had before. Let's start, now you have E to the I S H, E to the minus I T H, uh, uh, the projector, the projector, the HKL operator, e to the ith, e to the minus uh, ish, and this whole thing is evaluated uh, at s equals zero. And now you can just do a change of coordinates in this in this time integral uh, to reduce it to the following expression: d star uh, plus s, d star minus s. Okay, uh, and but this whole thing is evaluated at s equals zero, and you know uh, by whatever the fundamental theorem of, of, anal of analysis or something, um, this is just a boundary term. Okay, so here what you get is you just get um, well you can write it the following way minus ic, and then you just get uh, the projector at time t, the hkl up at time t star, the hkl operator at time t star. Um, minus the same thing at time minus t star. Oops, t star. Okay, you just pick up the boundary term, uh, but now if you insert that into the state psi zero, here you have a projector onto uh, a different state that has been evolved by T star, which is order one. Uh, so, you know, what you'll pick up here is the, the return amplitude. So you, you'll pick up terms like psi zero, psi T star squared. And remember we said that this is exponentially suppressed in N. Okay, so the thing that you have left if you evaluate it in psi zero is exponentially suppressed in N. Okay. Which means that to all orders in perturbation theory, to all orders in one over n, the commutator between phi hat and h is zero. Uh, so, so Alex, it acts like the HKL operator on psi zero, but if you acted on the state e to the iht psi zero, then it would not act like the HKL operator, right? Because it would commute with the Hamiltonian. So it would act at a different time because this time is being set autonomously inside the state, right? Not not from the boundary. Yeah, that's right. It always no, it always acts at the same time. Yeah. Right, so, so, so the HKLL operator doesn't do that. I mean, the HKLL operator acts at a time which is set by the boundary. I mean, if, right. if, if you, yeah, if you think of this physically, it's like some supernova going off and when the supernova goes off, this acts. Yeah, The HKLL exactly. operator acts whenever you want it to act. Yeah, yeah, so this, this operator always acts next to the supernova, no matter if you're at t equals zero or at some much later time. Right, right, yeah. Uh, I, 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 yeah, yeah I, so I, 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 yeah. I mean, I haven't talked about this. 
I haven't talked about the second point yet, but the second point is that it. Um, uh, sorry, I have a question on this. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, maybe I didn't follow it. So, what was the role of the projector here in this derivation, in the last two steps that you showed? I mean, if what would have happened if the projectors would not have been there? Oh, if the p zeros were not there. Yes. Uh, you would not have the PT stars here. You see. Um, so, it, say say you get rid of this. Then you'll get rid of these. Um, but these are precisely the things that uh, uh, allow you to get the exponentially small uh, answer. Mm, I see, because uh, without that, this- uh, without, this without that, you would just have phi acting on the state phi zero, which is order one, right? So, so you would oh, have okay. the same problem at order one over Okay, so in that context, so this thing is that I think if you, uh, so my worry is that if you make the statement, then you have to also say that this projector is true. Uh, I mean, maybe it's not so much state dependent, but depends on the class of states, of course, on a subspace, right? Oh, I mean, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So this is very, this is a very state dependent construction, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise, this statement is not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, it's it's we use the state dependence in multiple places. First of all, this only works around the particular class of states. Moreover, the construction of the operator involves the state itself, right? Yeah, this is somewhat similar to this uh, statement of state dependence in this uh, uh, of the entanglement wedge, uh, where they were claiming this paper by Pennington and all. They were claiming that the that the state dependence of the entanglement wedge is essentially only through the subspace. Uh, you look at the subspace and just look at the maximum most, uh, uh, um, the macrocanonical ensemble there. And then, uh, uh, so that determines this. Uh, so there's something similar statement here that this projector, so you're called, so basically it's like uh, this projector that we're defining is on some uh, special uh, classes of states. Yeah. And yeah. That's right. That's right, and it's explicitly used in the in the construction. Yeah. Good. One second. Uh, yes. Actually, actually, I I I I have a question for Subra. <laughs> so Subra, so you uh, you you're let me understand your comments. You are basically saying that uh, I mean Alex's construction makes these phi's to act at the star, particularly which makes this. Uh, you know, expectation value zero because it becomes exponential. That, that's that's what you meant, right? Uh, so I, I was just saying, actually, Alex should answer this question, but I was just saying, you know, the way physically this works is there's some time dependence in the state, right? So imagine there's some supernova which is going off. Mm -hmm. This is the, the the path Alex didn't take, but I think it's it's a little clearer physically. Then, then you, you make the operator act whenever the supernova goes off. So, you know, if you act with the boundary Hamiltonian, it doesn't shift the operator because the operator just detects when the supernova goes off and it acts at that time. So, you know, it, it commutes with the boundary Hamiltonian. It's using some, you know, it's using a clock that's intrinsic to the state rather than using a clock that's set by the boundary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, so, but uh, so, Vrat, I mean, Alex is starting always from the boundary, right? And you don't yeah, have yeah. an inclusive I'll, definition of the time in the bulk. He, he is, I'll, but I. Yeah. I'll, I'll discuss the bulk interpretation later, which is exactly, I mean, we've, I guess we've already started doing that. The, the bulk interpretation is that you're dressing or you're using as a clock a feature of the bulk, you know, when the supernova goes off, right? And the point is that the supernova goes off at some moment in time in the bulk and you're putting your operator next to that. Um, and it doesn't matter if now from the boundary point of view, you're at some time or at some later time, right? But you're always, no, no matter how you insert the operator, you always, instruct it to, to insert it next to the supernova, independently of what time you're at, at the boundary. Good. Um, so, um, so, so the second property now is to uh, make sure that it acts as the HKL operator. So maybe I should have set on the state psi zero and, and, and a finite number of single trace uh, insertions on it not on states of the type psi of t. Okay, so how do we know? So what we want to show is that this thing is the same as if I had replaced phi hat by phi hkll up to one over n corrections, right? Uh, so we can just, you know, write again one more time the definition of our operator, t. Now there's going to be O, oh, here's our zero. And actually, let me directly rewrite this uh, in a different way. 
dt uh, phi hkll of t t and then there's all the bunch of operators okay and then now it's the same story as before you have a projector pt here uh, that'll be inserted into a state psi zero so this will also involve again overlaps of psi zero psi of t that are exponentially suppressed uh, so as you do the time integral here um, if you go amount some some amount of time in 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 t the the the, the integral is exponentially suppressed Okay, which means that you can evaluate this time integral by a saddle point, and the saddle is just picking up the thing at t equals to zero. Okay, so now you evaluate this by saddle point, and the saddle is at t equals to zero. So at t equals to zero, what happens? Well, you have to have this constant, and you just get psi zero. 0, 0, 0, projector P0, phi HKL of 0, P0 of, but then you can get rid of the P0s because now they're just acting on psi zeros. I mean, there's a finite number of operators between them, but that doesn't matter because P0 projects onto the entire code subspace, okay? Uh, and plus one over n corrections. Um, and now you see that in fact, you recover what you wanted. You recover that it acts the same way on the code subspace, um, it acts the same way on the code sub on the code subspace um, uh, as the HKL operator. Okay, so this is the second one. Okay, so what I've done is that I've I've proven the two properties that that I set off here uh, to prove. Oops, oops. Sorry, I touched my cable. Can you see? Can yeah. you see my screen? Yeah, sorry, I touched the cable. Okay, so I, I approve these two properties. Um, uh, so now let me go to uh, interpretation and comments, and then and then I'll finish. Okay. So the first thing that we should discuss and we already have is the bulk interpretation. So the idea is that if we have our, our supernova space-time with matter contracting the explosion and things acting out, uh, we started with an operator, which was phi HKL that you know, we built in a way to be near the supernova, but we constructed it uh, from the HKL prescription, which means that we dressed it with respect to the boundary. And then the idea is that we did this, we inserted these projectors, we did this time integral. And, and what we did is that we sort of took this, this dressing that was to, to the boundary and we dressed it to a feature of the state, to the supernova explosion. Okay. So now the new dressing, let me make it blue maybe. The new dressing is with respect to the supernova. Okay. Uh, but now since it's stressed with respect to a feature of the state, well, there's no problem with it commuting to the boundary homogen. Okay. Um, and this works well in states where you know that there's a semi-classical geometry. There are states that are in the class of what I discussed. Uh, you know, if, if you had a brain, say if you had an end of the world brain behind the horizon, it's also geometrical. So you would imagine that now the dressing, instead of being with respect to the boundary, has been set towards the end of the world. There's also other states where um, that satisfy all the properties that I gave you. They have a large energy and a large variance. Uh, where, um, but that don't have a sort of geometrical feature that we understand in the bulk. Um, there, it's not so clear where the dressing is located. Maybe the idea is that it's dressed with respect to a feature of the state, but in, in a kind of non-geometric way, we don't really know. Um, okay, so, 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 so that's a subtlety, but if, if, the, if you understand the bulk space-time and it has a nice semi-classical geometry, uh, the dressing is with respect to a feature of the bulk state. So, so, Alex, can I ask you about that? Uh, sorry, Alan, go on, please. I, I'll ask later. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I, I was saying that, that uh, yeah, uh, Alex, in, in this subtlety is, a, is an important one, right? 
because it would if you just take a black hole in the canonical ensemble it would meet all the criteria that you had uh, so you could you know just took a typical micro a black hole in what in the a typical microstate with as, as much spread in energy as you have in the canonical ensemble yes then i think you can do what we do yeah it would be but i think then this 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 uh, operator is not really creating an excitation i think it's basically cycling you between microstates the reason i say that is because as you said the time is undefined right i mean it it acts at some undefined time and yeah. every microstate you know has some statistical chance of having a fluctuation like if you jump in it at some time there's always some exponential small chance you might encounter a fluctuation so this operator just basically changes the time of that fluctuation but if you jump in at time t equal to 0 the chance that you will encounter the fluctuation created by this operator is is exponentially small right because it's acting at an undefined time isn't that so uh that's an interesting thought that i haven't that i haven't thought of so what you want to say is you want to say okay let's create this operator now that we think is somewhere and let's jump in to the boundary right. in one of these states right and you're saying when do you meet it and what you're saying right. you, you just don't right. it's exponentially you never meet it it's exponentially yeah. small yeah you might meet it if if the microstate was like tailored in such a way that the time of the operator exactly happened to coincide with when you jump in but you know in most microstates it won't happen and so the chance you'll meet a fluctuation is exponentially small but you see that's the same as the chance you'd meet an exponential in a typical as you'd meet an excitation in a typical microstate so i think the in such microstates where you don't have semi classical bulk dependence i think you should think of these operators as just cycling you between microstates not as creating an excitation let, let me just take a step back i mean we anyway this is kind of the discussion part of the talk so let's spend as much as much time as we need if that's okay with you guys um uh, so so i think one of these typical states outside of the horizon will look just like the black hole right right so now we want to create some operator that's you know some distance outside the horizon uh we do it with hkl but then what we'll do is we'll use our our machinery to send the dressing somewhere else right oh i i will i want yeah you could do it you could do that sure then it would then it would probably get pushed very close to the horizon i was thinking of making it behind the horizon but you could do it outside sure yeah yeah if you do it outside i think you but you'll be able to detect it right uh, in that it it'll probably get pushed to some it it'll be like one of those uh, you see every typical microstate has an excitation at some time you know if you wait long enough you'll always encounter an excitation so this is yet another one of those states right I mean, maybe earlier you encountered the excitation at e to the n squared. Now you encounter it at 1.1 or 0.9 e to the n squared. Some, you know, at some at some undefined time. But I don't think it has any features that are different from that of a typical microstate. It's as typical as any other microstate. I I think. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but this is what I think. Okay. I, it's a I, so the, the I'm just sort of. thinking I, i haven't thought about this it's an interesting point what i would have thought is that if you consider this state act with it with phi h k l and now try to probe it from the boundary with a with another copy of the single trace operator i would have thought you detect that that excitation uh, but you you engineered it so you wouldn't detect it right i mean you engineered it so it, i mean you're right you detected it at some time uh, you see uh, if i take well, a, one you, of these typical microstates there is some time when the correlators become atypical because there's some fluctuation in the state no i think what you were saying well. probably sorry subrat so i think what you are saying is related to my earlier comment on this fact that this projector might uh, be the same for a class of substates uh, states up to say one over some very small correction exponentially small corrections the projector could be simply a property of a space of states rather than a particular state Uh, no no i think the state dependence is fine i don't object to that it so they, you know they're saying that you know you you take these states and you you act with this pt and you integrate over time so it gives you an operator but you see in the case where you have a supernova like the one you have in the slide there's a yeah. well defined sense of when the operator acts it acts when the supernova goes off uh, in these typical states it's dressed to some fine grain feature of the state you know it's dressed to some time which is set by some delicate phases or something in it, in the state so it's basically set to some undefined time for the boundary observer i think 
and that is exactly like a typical like a fluctuation like a thermal fluctuation so it's you know which all states have yeah so you're saying it moves you around in this space of exactly thermal fluctuations of typical black hole microstates exactly exactly but but that's 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 super fine i mean that's not something that you, you, you ever really see um, right right but i think that's what this is doing in these typical states in that you write down this operator and it's kind of moving you around it's not really doing something like semi classical okay that that's that's very interesting yeah i hadn't thought about it okay um, okay uh, I have a related uh, actually point and uh, questions. Uh, so in the Hong Liu approach, they say that uh, you can create uh, new times uh, from the boundary perspective on the algebra of observables in a time band because it's type three one and, and then there are these emergent modular times that you can create. Uh, so essentially this additional dressing that you are creating is with respect to some observer or some, something, something that you, can, you need a heavy object in this case where you can attach some other Wilson line in the bulk or uh, some other point in the bar. So in that case, uh, I'm just saying that, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so is there a relation between this Hong Liu's approach and your approach in the sense that uh, uh, this kind of emergence of new times also requires some, semi some kind of the semi-classical properties that you're thinking about? And, and I, I think Hong Liu and, and, and like you and Leuthers have mostly considered like the time band to be like very, very large, like right to take the entire sort of CFT time band to to really consider like the entire outside of like the horizon of the black hole. Um, the, the, the one thing that I'll say is that, I mean, we can talk about dressing with respect to an observer, but I don't know what that means. And I think the way you should think about these supernovas is that that's, that's how you should think about an observer. Like the supernova is a classical thing and you dress with respect to that. Um, so, so I think it's the, the supernova is a better example of things that you're allowed to address with, with respect to, uh, whereas just saying an observer is not really clear what that means microscopically. Here, that it's very clear that there's a microscopic definition. Um, so the, I think the idea is the same, but 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 I like you know dressing with respect to a solar system or a supernova or something. I think to me it makes more sense because we know what it means microscopically, whereas saying I just, I put an observer in a book in the book and I dress with respect to that. I'm not exactly sure what those words mean. Um, yeah, but so, I think the Hong Liu's kind of approach would also apply to a small time band. I mean, this, uh, there's no, it's not necessary to have a huge time band maybe. I mean, okay, I think he, of course, for the purpose- he, he wanted to, Yeah, I think, I think presumably you can, you can, I mean, the, the nature of the algebras I think will be the same, and so- uh, yeah. So, but but you don't see any obvious connection between his approach and yours. Like, yeah. the, not the, I would say not directly. Yeah. Okay. Um. Good. Um. So another comment is that. Uh, oops, let me go back to writing. Okay. Is that this only works? In a class of states, it doesn't work in energy eigenstates. Okay, and it doesn't work in the vacuum, uh, which is nice. So there's there's no deep contradiction. You know, like uh, Subrad and friends had a sort of proof that in the vacuum uh, you can you cannot localize information, and we don't disagree with that. The vacuum lies outside the class of states that we consider here, so. If you try to run this program for the vacuum, you wouldn't get no suppression of the overlaps. And so you would not be able to do what we did here for the vacuum, okay? So there's no contradiction with, with that statement. Um, and, and, and maybe a, a final comment and then, and then I'll end there. Um, keep changing colors. Uh, and it has to do with islands. So, you know, if you consider some system where you have an ADS geometry, you couple it to a non-gravitating bath, you know, and, and, and you look at, you know, you look at, I don't know, some, some slice of the, of the bath uh, at some late times, and then an island appears inside, uh, which we think is encoded, um, which, which we think is encoded in, in, in the green lines of the boundary, right? This, this is the islands. Uh, now there's a puzzle that, that, that Subrat and friends raised in another paper is that if you act with a local operator here in the islands, 
uh, well, where, what are you going to address it with respect to? And sort of the only thing that you might have guessed, the only natural thing that you might have guessed is that you dress it with respect uh, to the boundary. Okay, because that's how we always dress things. Um, and I think what our prescription shows is that uh, even if that's what you started with, you took some operator deep inside and you dressed it with respect to the boundary, you could you know, run our protocol and then you would move the dressing from the boundary to the radiation. You would get, obtain a new operator that acts uh, in the same way to, to leading order, um, but that commutes with the Hamiltonian so, so that the dressing is you know, with respect to the radiation. Now, I'm not exactly sure how to how draw that on, on, on this diagram, but I don't know. It's dressed with respect to the radi radiation. Um, okay, so you, you, you can, even if you had an operator, an island operator that did not commute with the boundary Hamiltonian, you can run a procedure and engineer a new operator that does commute with the Hamilton. Um, okay, and this may be relevant in, in resolving some puzzles related to, to, to entanglement wedge reconstruction in this context. Uh, but in any case, I'm, I'm out of time. It's 10 past. Let me stop here and then we can continue for as long as we get on for the discussion. Okay, so before you uh, start question, let me suppose, let me just end the talk of, officially, then we can, of course, go on with questions. Uh, so I, I would just comment, it's really surprising that the talk ended in one hour and 10 minutes. So, <laughs> okay. So, okay. So let's have questions then. Uh, can I ask a question about the last last thing you said? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, we, so just to, just to be clear, we had two criticisms of the island proposal. One of them was a a uh, non-perturbative criticism, which is the thing that you mentioned at the beginning, which is, you know, to define the entanglement entropy, you would need to have some non-perturbative splitting. And the second yeah. was a criticism of the entanglement wedge proposal. I mean, which is what you said, which is that islands and entanglement wedge. This is the part that you discussed right now, right? But yeah. the, the first one, I guess, I guess you didn't, you, 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 we don't want to discuss. The first one I agree with. I think if you want to define something non-perturbatively defined, I think it's clear that you need a non-gravitating right. region. I, I don't know what else you could ever do. Fine, so fine. But let, let's just discuss the second one, which is the, the entanglement wedge one. I'm not sure this operator that you said does what, what we needed to do in entanglement wedge reconstruction because of the comment that we made earlier. You know, usually what you'd want is an operator where you see the radiation region and the boundary here have a common clock because then some non-gravitating region. So you want an operator that acts at a time t, which is set, which you know, which you could decide in the radiation region. But this operator that's acting in the island, when you run your protocol, I think it also makes the time undefined, like it spreads it out over a, a long time. So in fact, we in, in in this yeah in this paper we had some discussion of this. You're, you're saying if. It, it would be sort of like smeared over something like this. Exactly. And and that smearing would be at least the time scale of the evaporation of the black hole. In fact, we discussed this in, in our paper in, in one in appendix A. You know, you could write down an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, provided you smear it out over a time scale that's of order n. So it's not a sharp operator, it's some very smeared operator. The, this is what I think your protocol would do. Maybe I'm wrong, but but this is my impression that. Uh, because it doesn't act at a well-defined time anymore now. I mean, there's nothing semi-classical except for the evaporation of the black hole itself to address it to, but that happens over a page time. Uh, as opposed to that, in the, in the cases where the island computation has really been done, you know, the, the, the theory of gravity really is massive. So, you know, you really can write down operators that don't commute with the Hamiltonian. So, uh, you know, we, we never said there was a contradiction in the island itself because they do it in, in no, these it's massive. It's clear that any operator that you write here commutes with the Hamiltonian, right? So, so that's right. There, there's clearly bad operators that commute with the Hamiltonian. No, no, they, they can do more, right? Because the theory of gravity in the bulk is also massive. Oh, I can annotate this. That's nice. Uh, uh, you see, th this island here itself, an operator oh, in the nice. island also commutes with the Hamiltonian because. Uh, as a result of the back, I mean, this is the cases where the island computations have been done. As a result of the back reaction of the path, the gravitational theory in the bulk becomes massive. And so, you know, the commutator that you got with the Hamiltonian in standard gravity, there's no Gauss law in the bulk. So our, our puzzle was that if you tried to do it, try to find islands in a standard theory of gravity, then you would run into this contradiction. But I'm not seeing how the construction you mentioned immediately resolves uh, this puzzle, but, but maybe I'm missing something. So that's, yeah. 
sorry yeah so sorry just so i understand you would say that for the puzzle to be sharp you, you should not have a non-gravitating bat you should start with a setup where you're strictly at, at the boundary right if i'm mean, sorry where you just have you know a boundary system a standard setup and, and then there's going to be then there's going to be an issue yeah, so if you have a non-gravitating bath, then anyway, the bulk theory is massive. I mean, this is this is some this is just a feature of all of yeah. these island computations. So then, yeah, then we don't have a puzzle to start with. In, you, we don't even need your construction because you can just write down an operator immediately that commutes with the Hamiltonian, even without your construction. I think. I see. Uh, so the puzzle would really arise if, if if you're in some setup like this, but but this is where I, now I understand better sort of the double puzzle that you're saying, because you're saying in a setup like this, how do you define the, the non-perturbative entanglement entropy to even start with? Right, but also in a setup like this, where maybe if you had a small black hole evaporating in ADS, uh, the, yeah. the, yeah, the, the time at which your operator acted would not be well-defined. And I, I worry that if you ran your protocol, uh, it would like spread- it would delocalize it in time completely. Yeah, it would delocalize it in time. Uh, Okay, that's an interesting comment. Yeah, um, I don't think I have anything to say in real time. I would need, need to think about it. Um, yeah, yeah, we should talk. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, we should talk more about this. Yeah, it's it's an yeah, it's an interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Any further question? So let me ask a question uh, to Alex. So when you uh, when you say that uh, uh, this is non perturbatively it is hard to uh, it is not possible to do that. Do you is it conceivable that uh, you can have parametrically small entropies? And uh, for instance, in the case of the small black hole in ADS, that's what would happen, right? Because I think that it is true that it is um, you will have uh, perturbated you know because the construction that you did was perturbated. But I would imagine that if uh, for a large black hole, anyway, there is no real question of evaporation. So I was wondering if it is possible to do this for small black holes in such a way that you have you have an extra parameter because there is this claim that uh, small black holes are dual to submatrix weak confined phases. So you'll basically have an extra parameter, which is M by N. So I was wondering if that is possible to utilize in some way. So, so that would so mean that you have a, you have a parametric Two yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Please go ahead. I yeah. think there's two sort of separate questions here, which is one, whether what do you do for the small black hole? And two, whether you can do something non-perturbative. Those, those are, I'd say, two separate questions. I think the non-perturbative thing, whether you're in a large, small black hole, whatever, like you if, I just I agree with that. Yeah. I, I don't see a way to do it. So no matter if you know if if you're in a microcanonical window centered around the small black hole energy, um, it's still true that if you consider the algebra of all operators in the CFT at one moment in time, there's just nothing. That I agree with that. Yeah. That. So so I think defining something non-perturbative, I think, is doomed to fail. I mean, I right, I, I believe right. in I, yeah. So I, I think that will not work. Now, the second question, which is more subtle and super interesting, and I think really worth exploring is, okay, forget about doing something non-perturbative. Let's do something that just, you know, maybe works in one over n, defining quantities that work in one over n perturbation theory. Uh, what do you do for the small black hole? Um, and the idea, I guess, is that um, naively, you might have not really known how to split the Hilbert space in the small black hole, because you can't do spatial entanglement more at, has to do with internal degrees of freedom somehow. Um, but, but this gives you a way in principle, right? This says that, you know, at least, you know, form a small black hole through some collapse of some matter. Uh, then you can run our protocol. You can start constructing local operators and maybe, maybe it's possible to isolate regions. So maybe you can talk about the algebra of operators that are outside a radius R or something like that. Now you can define an entropy associated to those, um, to those operators and ask whether or not if you compute that entropy, whether you see, I don't know, Hawking's answer or not. Okay, there's, there's a very set of stages that need to be taken to, to do this. And, and maybe it fails, I don't know, but I think it's an it's certainly an interesting question and it's worth trying. 
And okay, we've thought about it a little bit, but not much more than the words that I just said. I think it's I think it's very interesting. I have a kind of related question. I'll say one more thing is that apart from this, I just don't know what else to do. I don't, this gives you at least a way that you can imagine trying to split the Hilbert space. It's not a real split. It's a split that makes sense in one over n perturbation theory. And I think that's interesting because other than that, I'm just very confused of what else we should do at all. Yes, I am, please, sorry. Uh, yeah, so my question here is when you have an island or something of that kind, so uh, so if I've taken operator just outside the island versus some inside the island, right? Uh, uh, there seems to be no difference in your construction about uh, to distinguish between such operators uh, in principle, right? I should be, I'm asking because there is this issue about, uh, there is a claim that uh, there are certain uh, operators should be very hard to reconstruct versus those operators which should be, Easy to reconstruct. That's that's a, that's kind of a notion you have in 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 the context of entanglement wedge. Uh, but uh, uh, like parts of the entanglement wedge are easy to construct, parts are harder to construct. And uh, yeah. so in this context, you uh, how how does that reflect uh, in your construction? Yeah, you're asking like about the Python lunch story. Um, yeah, the short answer is I don't know, and maybe this is related to. So what Surat was saying, it's possible that in some way, if the operators are too hard to construct, are in this Python's lunch region where they're very, very complex to construct, maybe if you try to run our protocol, it's possible that, um, I mean, our protocol, I would say is really about the dressing, right? So as a, as a seed for our protocol, anyway, you have to tell me how you reconstructed it from the, say the HKLL description, right? So, so that's, that's a starting point. So anyway, you need to do that first. And then our protocol it's, is meant to just get rid of the dressing part. So I, I think actually the, the, the difficulty is in the seed that we feed into our protocol, not into our protocol itself. Now, it's possible that if you feed into some, a very complicated thing into our protocol, maybe it delocalizes over time very much or something like that. That, that I don't know. But I would say constructing the operator itself is, is uh, issue that you need to do first before running our protocol. Yeah, this is a related question because if you want to see where the extremal surface is or distinguish where it is, where we are inside or outside the island, you need some non-perturbative corrections to begin with because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not really perturbative in one over n that you can locate this extremal surface uh, in some way. So, uh, so uh, maybe this is what uh, creates this tension because uh, and there seems to be something that should be missing, uh, or I don't know that this, this is maybe I'm just uh, this some this puzzle can be resolved, but uh, seems to be still a puzzle in your construction that how how this uh, how this uh, complexity can arise in the reconstruction of the island or something because that's what you need also to that's that's what is expected right or very other from other grounds. Yeah, yeah. The way I think about it is really, I mean, there's a question of reconstruction that you need to address. And then, you know, the, the Gauss law or the dressing is sort of a subtlety that lies on top of this, right? Saying that even if you could do this, where do you send the dressing to? I think our protocol is meant to say, if you did dress it towards the standard boundary, you can run the protocol to get rid of it. Um, that, but, but that's it. It's not meant to like, be a protocol that really reconstructs it from the get-go. You, you, you have to feed in this C to HKLL thing. And you know, doing HKLL for inside is it's difficult, right? So, so, so it works really best in, in a situation like this, where you know you just have some supernova and then it's clear what you're supposed to do. I see, I see. Yeah. So you have to have some HKLL to start with. Yeah. Something. Yeah, you have to you have to feed in the seed thing, right? To start with. Now maybe the seed thing you started turns out that it's dressed to the boundary. And then we can run our thing to get rid of the dressing. Okay, so thanks. Uh, then can I ask one more question? Sorry. Okay, sure, sure. So uh, actually it is for Subra, so because he's here, so let me just ask it because. Um, so I heard that, uh, so one of the things that you were saying was uh, for, uh, for massive gravity. So I've never quite understood this, uh, why massive gravity can save us, because uh, there also ultimately somehow you would want different values, right? So, so Jitan, I, you said something or 
Yeah, so I was saying that in the case of massive gravity, how does one escape uh, this problem? Because even there, I would have thought that ultimately you would need uh, uh, different variance, right? Even though there is no Hamiltonian constraint. No, I, I uh, so no one has worked this out in detail, but I think the constraints of, sorry, Alex, if you want to uh, uh, answer no, this. I think you go ahead, go ahead. I think the I'm constraints curious. are, yeah, modified. They're not, you don't have first class constraints any longer. No one has really worked this out carefully, but uh, yeah. I mean, some, some of the students we have, yeah. Uh, so actually, Joy Deep and Diksha and of our students are, were thinking about this, but you know, there's a way to understand this from these W holographic models. I'll take the liberty of annotating. Uh, you know, in these W holographic models, the, the picture is like this, right? Like this is ADS4. You have an ADS brain and this is ADS5. Uh, or, you know, whatever, it can be ADS N and N plus one. And the island is here. And the way you dress the operator is just, just this way. You run the Wilson line this way to the radiation yeah. region. Yeah. So mm -hmm. The fact that you have this embedded in higher dimension in the ADS4 manifests itself as, as massive gravity. And the fact that the Wilson yes. line can run off the brain, I mean, is, is a consequence of that. So, uh, but yeah, I think you can, you don't have this, the commutators with the Hamiltonian are modified because you don't have a Gauss law. You can't detect the energy even at infinity in massive gravity. No, no, I agree that there is no Gauss law, but the thing that bothers me is that uh, if you fundamentally have different variants of any sort, all the observables will be at boundary anyway, right? Do you have, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know, do you have, is diff invariance understood in some good way in for these massive theories? Of yeah, but yeah, that's, but that would, I would say that that's a kind of an argument based on ignorance yeah. rather than like, a, you know, like I agree with you that massive gravity, I don't think it is well understood and probably it is not even clear whether it is, um, you know, yeah. But I think maybe we yeah, are saying yeah. the same thing. Yeah, so just to say in these W holographic models, there's a geometric picture of what this means. Within the intrinsic massive gravity theory, I agree your question is valid. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the W holographic models, there's a geometric picture in that the- Right, but I think in the fully back reacted thing, I think if you, this is kind of like a pro brain kind of construction, right? So yes. if you have a fully back reacted thing, I'm not sure that will work. Even then, you should be able to run the Wilson lines with the extra dimension. Yeah, but I think you know in the so so th there the question would somehow become that okay maybe I think we are going too far from Alex's talk, but uh, the in that case you know I would I would imagine that you have a thing kind of like you know the back reactive case of ADS as opposed to the brain system that you originally had, and in that case I'm not sure we have an understanding of massive gravity. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I don't have much to say about that. Yeah. 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 But I think the, the one comment that, that I can make is that this picture, where it's doubly holographic here, I mean, you can see the Wilson line being geometrized. And in the case where it's not doubly holographic, it's a, it should work the same way, but in a thing that's less geometrically manifest somehow. It's, it should be a non-geometric uh, version of the same thing that's happening. So you're dressed to the radiation, but not in a way that you can draw on the board because you don't have a space time to connect to. But the, it should it should roughly work the same way. You're still dressed the radiation, yeah. although maybe in a non-geometric way, and but maybe it's not so different. But you see, Alex, yeah, the but... point here is because you had the radiation region. Uh, if you look at some boundary Hamiltonian at this point, like this edge, it doesn't measure the energy in the orange region, and that the Hamiltonian is really not a boundary term in these models. It's not a boundary term at the at the boundary of ADS four. It's a boundary term in the full boundary of ADS three. So, yeah. so, and you know, this is what you said at the beginning of your talk. So then there's no puzzle to start with. If you, if the Hamiltonian is not a boundary term, then, then you don't, you know, then, then you didn't have to worry with, worry about it to, to start with. So, so your construction would be very interesting in the case where it is a boundary term. Maybe one more thing to say is, I guess if you had an end of the world brain sitting behind the black hole, then, you know, you could think of this, of your construction as moving the dressing from the boundary to the end of the world brain. Yeah, right. so, that works. That works. But that's not so different than the supernova. I mean, it's a bit more subtle because it's behind the horizon, but it's not, it's a sort of very atypical type of microstate where you have a geometric feature inside. Right, right. Um, so, right. you know, Kyriakos also had some paper with, with Jan and Eric about typical states and some kind of emergent brain that appears, you know, where the left CFP wants to be. Maybe you have to dress with respect to that, but now we go back into these questions that we were discussing a little bit earlier about whether really we can do that or whether that sort of delocalizes the operator in time. And right, right. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. just to think about for later. I mean, I, I'm I mean, we can discuss whenever. Uh, uh, it, I mean, I think what you really want is that you have a clock in the radiation region, and I act with this operator, and I also send in an infalling observer, and then I want the infalling observer to meet meet an excitation. So that's I think what we want. So I'm not sure this construction would do that, but but maybe somewhat maybe it does. So we should discuss that. Yeah. Okay, so thanks for all this nice discussion. Actually, I have some time cut off, so I have to. Okay, uh, yeah, no worries. We've okay. been at it for an hour. So. Yeah, so I hope that Alex will come back and give us another interesting talk on or sure. later. Okay, so very good. Uh, so thanks for coming thanks and I'll see you. I'll see you, all. See you again. Thanks, Alex, so for the nice talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.